praise God. My wife and I, Renee, we had a good ride down here this morning. It's always a, a, a pleasant ride um, coming down to Springfield. This is family. It's family. Um, I've been fortunate to be able to come down here, I believe, since the end of 2015. Um, and just a privilege that every time Pastor Mark goes on vacation, I'm just privileged that he, he calls me in. And, it's, and I'm humbled by that. And I, I thank God for the opportunity. You know, last week was a powerful week here in the church, and I thank God for that. I just want to give Jesus Christ a clap offering this morning. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So we thank Jesus for what he's doing down here in Springfield. Pastor Mark is a real good, a dear friend of mine and Sister Pauline. I think you all know that. And you are as well. Um, we're family. So I thank God that I'm here um, this morning. You know, last week was touching. I've been a, a leader in the ministry of Teen Challenge at different times over the years. Um, this time here, I've been back in the Teen Challenge Vermont since 2015. And I don't travel with the, with the choir. I did at one time or a couple of times, but I don't go out with the choir uh, usually. But I came here last week because... I just wanted to be a part of the fellowship, knowing that I was coming here today. And I thank God that we came down, Renee and I, because I witnessed, I really witnessed the power of God in, in such a way. Um, all of those men and women that were up here last week, I have the opportunity as a teacher in the ministry to pour into both of men and women. I teach in a woman's home and I teach in a men's home. I do different classes, group study classes, healing the wounds of childhood classes. So this stuff keeps me on my toes. It really does. It keeps me engaged in the word and in prayer. But last week, I got to witness how beautiful everybody looked up here. You know, I've seen how God changes us and just transforms our lives. And we become vessels of honor. You know, and every person that was standing up here, truly from the heart, I can say, have been touched by God. And every one of those testimonies were so powerful. And I thank God because there was a time, I'm sure, that everyone up here, including myself, I was ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I shied away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm sure that everyone up here, they've done the same. But when God came in and touched their lives, something changed. And I witnessed them standing up boldly and, and testifying, and they had joy. So we had great joy here last week. And then we went downstairs, and then we broke bread. And we had great fellowship downstairs as well. Let me just say, this is an awesome church. Amen? And thank God for that. I'm also glad that we're not on video today because that kind of thing makes me nervous. So I'm free to express myself. Amen? I got to think, um, how can I prepare a, a message for the church that, that would impact us uh, this week? And I've titled the message, There's Power in Unity. When I look at where I've come from in my life, it makes me humble. I just got to humble myself. I never thought in my wildest dreams that I would have a Bible in my hand and I'll be sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God has done that, not me. You know, the word says that no man comes to the Father unless he's being drawn by the Father. No person comes to the Father unless he's being drawn by the Father. So he drew me in, amen? Situations and circumstances got me to a place where 
I was broken, helpless, hopeless. But God reached down and pulled me out. Thank God. And I'm sure that God done the same for you. It's like nobody comes to, I think we all come to Christ out of crisis. Something takes place in our lives that gets us to a place and we say we need more. And that's when he steps in. So in sharing this message, The Power of Unity, I titled it. Coming out of Jesus' high priestly prayer that we find in John chapter 17. Now, in that portion of Scripture, then I'm going to pray, but in that portion of Scripture, Jesus gets to a place and he prays for himself. And then he prays for the disciples who he has been ministering to. And then he prays for the believers who are to come. And that will be us. And in that chiefly prayer, we see the power of unity. And God calls every one of us to that unity. Let me pray. Father, I'm just grateful here to be able to stand before you. I ask you, God, that you would just hide me behind this pulpit. And Father, that you would give me the words that you want me to say. Father, I just thank you so much for grace and mercy. I thank you, Jesus, that you called us, each and every one of us, by name. I thank you, Jesus, that you was not counting our sins against us. No. And I thank you, Lord, that you touched every one of our hearts and drew us to you. Father, I'm going to pray for this message. Father, that it will go forth and it will just accomplish, God, what you want it to accomplish. There is power in unity, Father. So help us, God. We're living in times where things are tough in the world right now. There's so much division, but there's no room for division. So we pray as believers, as the sons and the daughters of God, that we would rise and that we would take our stand and that we would promote promote Christ and Christ crucified. And Jesus, that we would have the opportunity to lead people to you. Jesus, that we would let our lights shine, the Bible says, before others, that they would see our good deeds and glorify our Father, which is in heaven. So this morning, Jesus, it's a good morning. It's a glorious morning. You've already impacted my heart. (laughs) And I pray in Jesus' name for the remainder of the service. God, that you would be high and you would be lifted up. I pray in Jesus' name. Father, that we would just love you more today than we did yesterday. And have your way with us. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Okay, so I'm going to relax, right, family? I just want to relax. Again, seeing, yes, seeing last week was so powerful. It was a powerful service. And um, looking at um, watching what took place and like I said, I don't get to go out with the choir all the time, um, uh, very seldom. But it's so good to see when people come out of darkness and people begin to, um, they see their identity in Christ Jesus. And they have a new life, amen. And then I, I get to witness the families being restored. You know, there's a portion of scripture I love to hold on to. It comes out of Philemon. Um, and it's, it's a small book in the Bible one book behind Titus and one book before Hebrews, Philemon. It's only like 25 verses in the Bible in that book. And when I look at that, it says, just perhaps. Now, this is a a letter that Paul sent back to Philemon, who was a slave owner. He had a slave named Onesimus, and Onesimus stole. Amen? Well, Onesimus got discipled by Paul. 
Onesimus' name is useful. It means useful, but there was a time where Onesimus was useless. He wasn't useful at a time. But anyways, Paul got a chance to disciple Onesimus, and then Paul sends Onesimus back to his slave owner Philemon with a letter. And in that letter, verse 15, it says, Just perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while is so that you may have him back for good. No longer a slave, but better than a slave, a brother useful to you and useful to me. That's powerful. Onesimus went back to his slave owner, useful not only to to his slave owner, but also to, to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I get to see that take place all the time through the ministry of Teen Challenge. When we see brothers and sisters come to the ministry and they get discipled, they get the word of God in them. And then we get to send them back to their loved ones. So the word is just perhaps, just perhaps the reason that they were separated from their loved one for that little while, that season, so that their family members may have them back for good. No longer a slave to drug addiction, no longer a slave to alcoholism, but better than a slave, a dear brother who's useful or a dear sister who's useful to you and to me. And then we see the gospel advancing in the lives of the men and women who come to the program and who embrace the call of God in their lives. And that's what this thing is all about, embracing the call of God. So I thank God. And doing that, Jesus gets to a place where he's been ministering to his disciples for the three years. He's been working hands-on with them. And Jesus says, the time has come, which is time for Jesus to depart. Amen? So Jesus goes and he begins to pray. And it's chiefly prayer. In John chapter 17, again, he prays for himself. He prays for the disciples who he's been ministering to the entire time, those three years. And then he prays for those to come. And in all of that, we see God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit working as one. And Jesus' ministry was so important as he prayed because he knew he was going, and he was going to sit at the right hand of the throne of God to make intercession for every one of us. But he had to encourage. He had to encourage his disciples, and he prayed. And he's praying to the Father. Father, I pray that you protect them and that you keep them. Well, this is what we need in these times, especially where we're living in now. And and this is such a powerful church. I love this church. And personally, I don't see disunity, I don't see dysfunction, but it happens in the churches all around the world. It's happening. And it's a time where we really need to come together. So I want to just bring this message before you. Coming off of last week, witnessing last week, I saw the power of God fall. I said, man, there's no better message to try to prepare than the power of unity. So in Jesus' high chiefly prayer found in John 17, it shows us how much is at stake with regard to the church's unity. God's name is at stake. His glory and his love is all tied to the unity in which his people I to live. You see, our bond as believers in Christ is much more than something to keep us from fussing and fighting amongst ourselves. It is a testimony to the world that the Lord and the faith that we preach are real. Sharing that. I never knew that I would be ministering the gospel of Jesus Christ to anybody I met. It wasn't in my cards. I didn't see it. But God had to do something in my life to get me to a place. Today, I just accept everybody. I've learned to love everybody. And there was a time that wasn't me. The old man, there was an old man there. (laughs) Amen. That old man, he's dead. But in this new life, it just it still blows my mind 
when I share with people, I says, I don't see bad people. I just don't see bad people anymore. I see people who are lost. I see people who don't have Christ. I see people who struggle to addiction. I see people who, who need the Lord and people that need help. But I don't see bad people. I thank God for that. But there was a time I saw bad people and I was a bad person. Amen. I didn't like myself. But when Christ came into my life and began to change me, I changed and I began to love people unconditionally. And I'm still learning to do this today. It's a work. It's an ongoing process. But it works. Amen. And it's warm. <laughs> so, it's a testimony to the world that the Lord and the faith that we preach are real. In the book of James, it says, what causes fights? James 4.1 says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle within you? You want something and you don't get it. Amen. This is when brothers and sisters are in, in dis disunity with each other. They're not getting along. What causes those fights and those quarrels among you? Don't they come from those desires that battle within you, the flesh? You want something and you don't get it. Amen. And we see this taking place in society right now. There's a lot of things that's taking place outside of the church. And it's bad. And if, the, if anything's going to change, it's going to change by the people in the church. We have the answer. Amen? It's, it's God's calling on us, the church, the body of Christ, to come in and make a difference. We don't get caught up in politics. We don't get caught up with, with the Republicans or the Democrats. We don't get caught up in that. Amen? You, you can have your belief. That's no problem. But to get caught up in the dysfunction is not what God has called us to do. We serve a king. Amen? And we have a kingdom. And we have an agenda here. He has an, a kingdom agenda that he wants us to teach and to preach. Do you know, God will respond to us on the basis of our unity or the lack thereof. Again, I'm sharing a message of, of hope encouraging, I believe, I hope I'm just encouraging here because this is a tight-knit family. And we don't have room for division here. Not in this church. I've known Pastor Mark and Sister Pauline for a long time. I love them dearly, and I've come to love every one of you. And I'm so glad that I'm here and I can bring this here because the, 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 the more we stay connected the more we're going to do for God. Amen? So when I said that God will respond to us on the basis of our unity or the lack thereof, it, this, whether it includes unity across denominations, economic statuses, eth ethnicities, or even genders, unity is critical to the movement of God's kingdom agenda by the church. And family, we are the church. Let me state this principle another way. If we are functioning in conflict and disunity, God will limit his work in our lives. He gives a command in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23. This is how important this is. And in this command, he says, Therefore, if you're offering your gift at the altar, and there you remember that your brother, and we'll add sister, has something against you, verse 24 says, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First go and be reconciled to your brother or your sister. Then come and offer your gift. Do you know the, the, the enemy's role is to divide us, is to get in between us, and to, he wants to divide and conquer. He wants to, he, wants to dis, he wants to disturb your day. He's out to kill us. 
This is how important this is. One body. Jesus is the head of the body. Amen? He's the head of the church. We're one body. If there's disunity, the responsibility now falls on me to go and make amends. I thank God for my wife. I'll use my wife as a prop right here. You mind me doing that, hon? Okay. So let's look at the scripture. He gives us command. If you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother had, or your sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. That's, that, would take, that takes humility. It takes humility to humble ourselves even when you feel you wasn't wrong. Because the scripture says, if your brother or sister has something against you, okay, what is it that you have against me? I must have done something wrong to disturb peace between us. But here I am, I'm coming to church, and I'm, I'm, I'm putting my, 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 my gift before the altar, I'm praying, but then I remember, because the Holy Spirit's going to reveal something's wrong. So as the Holy Spirit reveals something's wrong, my responsibility would be to go up to my wife, Renee, Renee, I'm sorry for what I've done. I apologize, and I work at it that it doesn't happen again. Now I come back, and I offer my gift before the altar. That's what God honors. That's what God honors. He, he doesn't, God's not pleased for me to keep that, the vision, well, well, she's mad at me. That's, she'll get over it. But we come to church and, and we're having fellowship. We're, at least we're trying to have fellowship. But the Bible gives instruction, so that tells me there's broken fellowship with God until that fellowship first is restored. I don't see it any other way. I, I don't see how the Scripture is going to say one thing and then we do something different and think that we're pleasing God. It doesn't happen that way. If the Bible is given clear instructions on what to do, Jesus goes on to say, if, if you love me, obey me. Sometimes it'll be our pride. And who's the father of pride? Satan's the father of pride. So sometimes it'll be our pride that'll keep us from bringing in the power of unity. And we'll keep disunity in a relationship because somebody got hurt and somebody's not willing to make amends. This is pretty important. I'm sharing this with you here in the church because... We're working out there. We really are. We're, we're, we're being contaminated by the world. We're being contaminated by the things of the world. But we're the church. We're the body of Christ. The Lord says, he said, we can live in the world, but we're not to do the things of the world. So we, we're not expected to respond the way they're responding out there. We are the ones who have to bring peace into the situation. And then when I bring peace into the situation and I go and I make amends with my wife, I'm still using you as a prop, honey. And so I go and I make amends to my wife first before coming into the place of prayer. Now I know that I'm being obedient to God. So now when I come to God, I, I left my gift at the altar for that moment, I went and I made amends. Now I'm coming back to the altar. 
and I'm praying. Now I'm praying with a clear conscience. Because I prayed in the right way. I prayed obedient, obediently unto the Lord. So why would not God back up my prayer and answer my prayer? Watch this one. If we have time to be blessed but not to be blessings. If we are selfish saints, first let me stop for a second. I, I, I spoke with Renee, and I said, Renee, this is, a, this is a good message, but they could think that I'm telling them that something's wrong. And how does that come across to you? And she says, no, not at all. So I hope that what I'm bringing to you It's not directed like you're doing anything wrong. That's not what I'm after. I'm after the unity and the power. Amen? So it says, if if we have time to be blessed but not to be blessings, if we're selfish saints who want things from God but don't want to mess with being functioning members of a local church, or if we're causing disruptions in the church by our attitudes or our tongues, then we're kind of like wasting our time when we ask God to do something for us. In fact, Scripture goes so far as to tell us that if we're people like that, then others need to stay clear of us. It says, Watch out for those who create divisions and obstacles contrary to the teachings that you've learned. The Bible says, avoid them. In, in Romans, that's Romans 16, 17. It says, avoid them. But elsewhere, Paul says concerning the church, and in 1 Corinthians 3, 17, he says, if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. And among those things, God hates is one who stirs up trouble among brothers, or another translation, or one who stirs up dissension. I want to stop there because I have a role in the, in the ministry of Teen Challenge, and I thank God what I do. But there's conflict all the time. We've got men and women who are coming in raw off the streets, and we got some brothers who are settled in and just they just think they're on their way out the door um, 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 because they got time in and they're doing well, but then they don't want to begin to help disciple the newer brothers coming in. That causes disunity in, in the body and, and dysfunction, and I see it. So I've got this, I, the, role, the role that I play in the ministry is, as a, as a teacher, learning center teacher for both campuses, but my role is the campus chaplain. So I have people in my office all the time. So I'm always putting out fires, small fires, because brothers aren't getting along, or sisters aren't getting along. So I, I thank God that I have this role and I can see things clearly today. Because the goal is to bring unity. Because when we bring unity, do you know there's power in unity? But, so I'm always in a position of trying to sit brothers down and crack the Bible open. I said, let's see what this looks like. What does the Lord say? Because the goal is to be conformed no longer, the Bible says in Romans 12, 2. It says, conform no longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you're going to be able to test what God's will is. The Bible says his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. So God's got a good will. He's got a pleasing will. God's got a perfect will. And to, and to get there, We have to conform no longer. In other words, the way I used to think 
the things I used to do, I no longer do. Get it? I have to change. My mind has, I have to line up with the word of God for my life. What does the word say? And that's the challenge right there. Bringing the word and then, and then helping brothers or sisters seeing we're called not to be hearers of the word only, but doers. So, 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 so we, we're challenged. God's going to challenge us. Amen. We're going to hear the word. But then we are to respond favorably to the word if we want the results, the good results. But that's the power of transformation, which says conform no longer to the patterns of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So that's what takes place all day long is in, in, in my orbit. <laughs> Praise God. Hmm. So I, I just shared in 1 Corinthians 3.17, and it says, Amongst those God hates is one who stirs up trouble among brothers or sisters. Uh, and in another translation, one who stirs up dissension. Proverbs 6.19. Now, this is not a small issue. It's not a small issue at all because God responds to his people's unity or lack thereof. In Ephesians 4.1, Paul says, Therefore I, the prisoner in the Lord, urge you to live worthy of the calling that you have received. Verse 2, With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I want to repeat verse 3. This is, I have the responsibility, we have the responsibility, it says, make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. This can be a very difficult task at times. But notice, Paul commands them to keep this unity, not to establish it. See, the church didn't create the unity. Jesus did. Amen? God created this unity. The church didn't create it. God calls us to preserve what he's already created. That's it. When I read that and I got a grip on that, I said, this is powerful. We're not called to change things. We're called to preserve things. Amen? God created this. So our role is to preserve what God has already created. I want to go in the Bible. I want to read from Ephesians chapter 2. I want to read a portion of Scripture, Ephesians chapter 2. I believe verse, yeah, verse 11 through 22. This is in the area of unity in Christ. It says, so then remember that at one time you were Gentiles in the flesh, called the uncircumcised by those called the circumcised, which is done in the flesh by human hands. At that time, you were without Christ, excluded from the citizenship of Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Jesus Christ, you who were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who made both groups one and tore down that dividing wall of hostility in the flesh. He made of no effect the law consisting of commands and expressed in regulations so that he might create in himself one new man from the two, resulting in peace. He did this so that he might reconcile both to God in one body through the cross by which he put the hostility to death. 
He came and proclaimed the good news of peace to you who are far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building, the whole building being put together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together for God's dwelling in his spirit. Now, this unity is tied to our Christian character and is based on the work of the Holy Spirit. So if your point of reference isn't the spirit of God, then you're operating from a merely human point of view. But when you relate to people based on God's point of view, the Spirit can override human differences and hold us together through the bond of peace. What is peace? Peace is harmony where once there was conflict and now we'll act like a belt that holds us together. Let me share what took place just this past Thursday on the campus of Teen Challenge. We had a chapel service. It was a powerful chapel service, and Renee got a phone call. As we were in chapel service, Renee got a phone call that her mother was rushed to the hospital. Now, right away, Renee got frantic because it's her mother, and it's been tough on Renee. She just lost two sons. She lost her, her, her oldest son, TJ, on June 2nd, 2021. And then she just lost her son, Jacob, on June 5th, 2022. So right away, it's the month of June. So when the phone call came in, we're in chapel, the phone call came in, she says, it's June. She was frantic. I'm telling her, Let, let's go. Let, let's just leave. Let's get back to the house, whatever. You know what Renee says? She says, no, I want to worship. She says, no, I want to worship. We got into the church, and we worshiped. We had such fellowship that the Spirit of God fell in the chapel at Thursday night, and it went long. We didn't get home to like after like 9.15, I believe we left. But her whole focus changed. She didn't want to leave. She wasn't thinking about going to Maine. She said, I just want to worship. You know what I witnessed in the power of unity? When Renee went to worship, she went to the altar to pray, and every sister in our program Ten girls rallied around her and laid hands on her and began to pray for her. It was powerful. We got to witness the power of unity like never before. So, so now we leave. We leave. It's like 9.15. We leave and we're driving home. She has her car because she had her car and I had my car. She's driving ahead of me and I'm trying to reach her on the phone. But I can't get her on the phone. So I'm thinking something's wrong. When I did get her on her phone, she's got a big smile on her face. <laughs> she said, I just talked to my mother, and my mother's okay. But the report that it came in, it was pretty serious. We saw things reversed right there by the power of unity and by the power of prayer. Amen. It was powerful. I keep using you, huh? It's okay. But we got to witness such power that day. It just blessed us. So when, I, so when I share this message, I'm looking at the responsibility that we have as the church. And the 
Jesus Christ has called us into fellowship with him. And I got to look at, I got married on April 9th, 2022. We got married. It was a Saturday. Easter Sunday was April 9th, 2023. Pentecost was May 28th, 2023. In this church here, the Pentecostal, it's the Pentecostal church. Do you know when the disciples came together, Jesus told them, Jesus told his disciples to don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of my Father, which he promised you. Luke 24, 49. Do you know, the Bible says that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, that the Holy Spirit fell into place. When they were in unity, He told him, don't leave Jerusalem. The disciples went into the upper room. Jesus appeared to his disciples after his resurrection. He appeared to them for a period of 40 days, the Bible says. And then he was taken up into this site. And then they went into that place and they waited. I'm not sure when they got into the room, they were all in agreement. I'm not sure, but I do know that they were in agreement. The Bible says they were in one accord when the Holy Spirit fell on the day of Pentecost. That power in unity. Those disciples at that time became bold. And Peter stood up that day. And 3,000 people, 3,000 were added to the numbers. Believers were added that day on the day of Pentecost. But in Acts 1 8, it says, And you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. Jesus told them, Don't leave Jerusalem till you receive the power. Power for what? Power to witness this glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. And when that day of Pentecost came, Peter stood up, bold, preached, and people gave their lives that day to Christ. People who were at one time enmity with God now became followers. Amen? Same thing with you and I. We have such a responsibility, and it starts in the the local church. Here we are, as family. The goal is to make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Why? So that we can do the work of the gospel. They need to see us. They need to see how we live. Amen? Amen? The world needs to see how we come together. The world needs to see how we bond together. How we bring two sides. People who are opposites of each other. And we come in and we bring peace. Blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons of God. That's our role. Powerful. And you know how it all started? It all started when Jesus left Calvary. No, not Calvary. When Jesus left heaven. Amen? When God sent his only begotten son into this world. That whoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Because there was a time you and I was at enmity with God. We too were separated from God. There was no unity. But God sent Jesus. 
to die in our place. And that we open up our heart and we receive him as our Lord and our Savior. God moved that, he, that, that wall was, was moved out the way and we came back over to fellowship with God. I shared the scripture here in the past in Romans 5.1. It says, we, we've been justified by faith and now we have peace with God. You and I have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. But there was a time when we had not opened up our heart to Jesus, we didn't have peace with God. But the moment we opened up our heart to Jesus, we made peace with God. And if we made peace with God, that means now you could expect the peace of God. If you have not made peace with God, there's no way you can expect the peace of God in your life. You first got to make peace with him. But when you open up your heart to Jesus Christ and you say, Jesus, come into my heart and be my Lord and my Savior, you just made peace with God. Praise God. And you become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And Jesus calls us to do the same works that he was doing. In fact, Jesus says, greater works that you will do because I go into the Father. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified through the Son. There's such a work to do these days. There's so much chaos taking place. There's so much hurt taking place. There's so much division. It's there and it's real. And we have the answer. Why? Because we have Jesus living on the inside, working on the outside. So we've got, we, we've got the hope of glory living within us. We bring a message of hope to people who are hopeless. We bring a message into people's hearts and homes where people are discouraged. People are discouraged. People are suicidal. They, they don't know. They can't find a way out. But yet we show them the way in. We have a powerful ministry before us. And I'm going to say something. There's no greater vocation. There is no greater vocation than sharing the gospel with somebody. And then you share in the, the, and you lead in them to a decision. You share with them the sinner's prayer. And they see themselves as a sinner. And you get to share them gospel. And you tell them, you must Confess your sins and open up your heart and accept Jesus in, into your heart. When that happens, there's no greater vocation than watching somebody come from darkness and into the light. Wow. Praise God. I'm going to close this message out. What encouraged me to share this message on the power of unity was because of what I witnessed last week. And I said, wow, wow. It's just amazing what God will do with a surrendered heart. It's amazing what God will do when we decide to get serious with him. And every person in this room, God wants to use you. You all have a testimony. Every person in this room has the testimony. There's somebody that needs to hear you speak. Somebody. There's somebody in your life that, that, that knows you. Amen. I have family members that are still unsaved. Does anybody in this room have family members that are unsaved? Sure we do. So we have such a work. You know, sometimes it's like harder to win your own family over. But we have power in agreement, and we have power in prayer. I watched last week a whole bunch of girls, this past Thursday. I watched a whole bunch of girls. Renee came down in, 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 our, in our chapel. Renee went down to the altar, and all the girls followed her, and they laid their hands on her. And I, and I just watched the power of God fall in that place. The worship was powerful. We're all in agreement. Amen. And God fell in a place. Everybody was elated. We had such a good time in the Lord. You know when we come in agreement, we can do anything for God. 
And I love this church. I don't mind coming back. <laughs> I love this church. Because I know that this church is, is it's established well. Seasoned leaders here in the church. It's a caring church. Given to the community. The youth group is, is growing. It's amazing what's taking place here in this church and in this community. And in Springfield, there's a lot of things happening outside of this church. But as you venture out into the community and share the message of hope, you're bringing hope to others who don't have it. What's the scripture there? Proverbs 13, 12. Hope deferred makes the heart grow sick, but when the desire comes, it is like a tree of life. So, so these people out here that don't have any hope because they don't see it, but they'll see the light of the gospel shining through you. Yes, you. And you share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And you share your testimony. And you bring them hope. Praise God. We have work to do, church. It's a great work. I encourage you just to continue to, to thrive and do just serve God. Fall in love with God and fall in love with people. Let's fall in love with God and fall in love with people. I've, I've coined a phrase, we're better together. Father, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, Father, there's power in unity. And yes, God, we are better together. We thank you, Jesus, that today we choose to follow you. You said, if any man wishes to follow me, he must first deny himself, pick up his cross, and follow me. I believe, Jesus, we're doing that here. Father, all of us here, God, we, we, we want to serve you. We want to fall more in love with you. So I thank you, Lord, for this time. And if there's anybody here, Father, who may be on the fence, not knowing how much you love them, or, or maybe not even knowing their calling, or their giftings, I pray, Jesus, that you would reveal to them. And I pray, Father, God, that you will provide for their every need. Father, those of us, we raised our hands. We have family members that are unsaved. God, I pray, Lord, that you would extend your hand to every family member. God, and that you would save our loved ones. Jesus, that we can all hold the testimony like Joshua said when he said, you choose you this day whom you shall serve. But for me and my household, we shall serve the Lord. So God, we thank you, Lord, for that. We choose to serve the Lord. Deliver our loved ones, Father. Deliver those who are still in darkness and who are darkness and in sin. I pray in Jesus' name, God, that you would move mightily here through the area of Springfield. Father, this church is up on a hill. It's like a city on a hill, and it can't be hidden. So we pray in Jesus' name, oh God, that you would bring those into this church, those who don't know you, those who, are, those who are hurting, those who are broken, those who are helpless. I pray, God, that this church would become a hospital to the sick. I pray for that. We pray in the name of Jesus, oh God, that the doors of Springfield Assembly of God are open. Father, we say bring them in, Father that we can help them heal and, and, and teach them your word, O oh God, and provide for their needs, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. So we thank you. As we depart here this day, O oh God, we pray that you will go before us, those of us who are traveling, God, that you would protect us on that travel. Father, that we pray, O oh God, for the work week. We pray for a powerful work week. 
God, help us to share the gospel with somebody at work. Father, we pray, oh God, that we won't hide our lamp, God, that we will put our lamp on, on a light stand. We will, put, we will light our lamp, God, and we would, we, that our lamp would light the whole house, Father. We pray for that. So, God, we thank you. We close out the service. We thank you, God, for Pastor Mark and Sister Pauline as they close out their vacation time. We ask you in Jesus' name, just, just bless them and help them and let them get the rest that they need. I know this was like a working vacation for Pastor Mark, so we just ask you, God, rejuvenate him, bring him back, Father, um, um, strong and and productive, we pray for that. And we just thank you so much for his wife, Sister Pauline. And God, on behalf of this ministry, Renee and I, Father, we, we love it. We love it down here. We love you. So we close this out, Father. We give you all the honor. We give you all the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.